Hello everybody, it's Scott again. Uh, again, one of these talks around about the Agile community and what we're doing around about the 20th anniversary of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, we're, we're trying to pull together something that I think we're we're rounding on calling a, a festival of the Agile community. And uh, and one of the things we're really doing there is, is, is looking at getting people from all over and uh, and get everyone together just to, just to look at the last 20 years, what's happened. Um, also, where we're at, who we are, where we're going, um, maybe you know, energize a new generation for for the next thing, and uh, got lots of people involved. One of the people involved that I'd be very, very, very uh, kind of happy that is involved is uh, is Dave Snowden. Um, I think he's probably a man who needs no introduction, but I will, uh, as this is probably going to a very broad uh, community, I will let him introduce himself and say a few things about his uh, about his work. Um, and uh, but first of all, Dave, uh, what what interests you in the the idea of the the uh, Agile Twenty reflect the, the the festival of the Agile community? I think there's several things, and there's a personal coincidence on it because the Canavian framework is 21 years old this October. So the two and they sort of came together in about 2008 and have stayed together since in terms of use. So there's a I think one is you, you need this point of ritual celebration for things. I think, I think that's actually quite important for humans. It's, it's a state of transition. And Agile's in a state of transition at the moment. It's kind of like, and one of the big questions is, will it survive? Yes, um, yeah, yeah I, I agree. A serious issue because the, the word has now been taken up and corrupted to mean to become the latest management fad. Yeah, so... I mean, one of my most popular talks at the moment is called Rewild in Agile. Yes, um, yeah. People keep asking on the basis that the, you know, that the resilience and strength of wild canines, of which there are only four or five, is nothing compared with the resilience of domesticated dogs, which actually die out very quickly and are highly bred. So I think there's this issue about the original vision of the founders and, and what was that about and have we lost it, which I think, to be honest, we have. We've now also got heavy commoditization of our job. Yes. And commoditization is one of the signs that something is coming to the end of its life cycle. So I think Agile 20 could be the point at which we celebrate a transition to something different or a point where we basically re-energize it or a point where we just recognize what was valuable when it got started. And I think that's an open book at the moment. Yeah, and, and possibly all three. Um, mm. uh, but definitely a reflection point. I think COVID um, is definitely driving it. Um, I, I love walking. And one of the things I'm noticing just now is mushrooms everywhere. And uh, it's interesting with mushrooms, it's it's like uh, you need to... What's that? Well, I go, I'm going walking in the Brecon Beacons and there are no contrails. Wow. I mean, normally, because that's yeah. on the main transatlantic route, you know, as I know, photog I'm a landscape photographer as well. So it, it's wonderful at the moment. Yeah. Hang on, we've got an interview. Interrupter, do you want to come and say hello? I want to talk to him too. Yes, you can talk to him. You met Dave when you were a little baby because you were on my shoulders. Hello. And we were at a conference, and that was the first time I met Dave. You were with them, and Dave's in Wales. Do you want to say hello? So this is Alba. Alba, named after Scotland. Hello, Alba. Hello. Hello. <laughs> right, Daddy's going to keep talking to Dave, okay? okay. And uh, we're going to keep this in the video, because it's fun. <laughs> Remember when my daughter was that age? Yeah. She's now 31, an anthropologist, works full time for me, and is the lead, it's a shop steward of my research assistant. So. Yeah, well, one of the things with the festivals, uh, yeah, one of the things with the festivals, my eldest daughter, who's 20, I've kind of roped her in now to, to look at comms. She's at uh, art school doing interaction design for computers. And uh, I just love the idea that, you know, I can, I can you know, share my passions so she can learn a bit more about me because uh, that's yeah, wonderful. That's always good. Dads and daughters, yeah. yeah. So, so, so just getting back to the point I was making, um, mushrooms, right? Um, yeah. When it gets, they get a frost or they get a flood or something, and then they start changing uh, away from being the, you know, the, the underground uh, thing. And I, I think there's a huge reservoir underground of agile, and I don't think it's really been explored. It doesn't, and it isn't really known. So one of the things that, if we can investigate that underground, that's interesting. Uh, but also, it's sort of a paradox here, though, because. 
I mean, I hesitate to say the heart of Agile because Alistair is using that now to mean something else. So I'm using it in a different way. The heart of Agile is probably in things like XP and aspects of DSDM. I mean, I was one of the three founders of DSDM way before Agile came along, and that was one of the feeds. Yeah. But it would never have scaled without Scrum. And I think this is the huge paradox. You know, wild ideas don't scale until they're structured, but then the temptation of structure can yeah. destroy the value. Now, Scrum didn't do that, but what came after did. Yeah, yeah and, and there's a whole debate around about, you know, what happened, what the influences were, how that, how that works, and... Uh... Um, one of the suggestions the that looked... there were no women in Snowbird, despite the fact there were women involved in the movement before Snowbird. That's yes, actually quite interesting. I, I I've got a, I've got a very strong theory on that. The, the last day of Snowbird was Valentine's Day, and which <laughs> and, and which woman's going to go away on Valentine's Day to a conference? Yeah, with now that? I've kind of like heard this story from other sides. All right, uh, there was definitely there was definitely some issues here. Yeah. So let's explore that. I mean, one of the things that the the reason I kind of came up with this was it was the the day after Dan Vacanti launched his Secret History of Kanban, <clears throat> and. Uh, and really launched that kind of uh, here's what we what we did and here's all the people who've written out the story. So there is a there is a bit of that. Um, I mean, David isn't the only sole founder of it. Is that the principle? Yeah? That is the principle. But it was a, it was a very it was a very kind of great talk, um, and I thought a generous talk because he, Dan was pulling in all the people that you know had contributed and and they kind of dropped from the record. Um, <clears throat> I think the final bit of the puzzle for me is um, you know great Deming fan uh, started off in manufacturing and statistical process control and loved Deming and I think at the age of seventeen I wish I'd got on a plane and went and had uh, <laughs> went and had dinner with Deming. De Deming, right. Deming understood complexity. I mean, I, I worked with Peter Drucker. Yes, um, that generation understood complexity. What came after didn't. So oh, I, completely. I, I, normally, I normally exempt Deming from the sort of systems thinking label. Yeah. 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 But I just wish I'd taken the opportunity to, to kind of be involved then. And uh, I didn't. And I, 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 again, I suspect at the 20 year point, a lot of the people who were involved in uh, you know, Snowbird, um, I mean, already we've lost you know, Mike Beadle and things. Um, so. Yeah, that was the tragedy. Yeah. I, was yeah. I, I know a lot of people in the Chicago police. I got a sudden email in on that. Yeah. Well, I just met him like three weeks before. We were kind of in the middle of an active conversation. So when the when the notification came back, I thought it was just him oh, coming back. As the... well, we were having a blazing row. So oh, I... the, 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 the police note came with, we don't attack him. He's just been killed, right? So it was okay. like, um, it was a bit of a shock. That All right. So, so I, I need to put a clarification notice out here. Uh, I anytime, anytime that Dave's attacking anyone, it's a hug. <laughs> I just don't I think anyone knows that. this. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we only, I mean, in my family, we only argue with you if we if we like you. If we're being polite, it means we're not sure whether you're trustworthy or not. Yeah, and if it's not, and I think the other thing is, I've noticed that if uh, if you're not actually worthy, you you don't you don't attack people either. So you've got to you've got to have got to have done yeah, something. Yeah, that's the other criterion. Yeah, um, yeah, no. I've I've completely I've completely forgot about it. Oh, and actually, this is this is a this is a really relevant bit. Um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed in your contribution um, has been around about the, uh, you know, we've been looking at enabling constraints. And one of the things that you came up with quite quickly, and I, and I think it might have been... Uh, um, and triggered. Yeah. Yeah, it did. <laughs> Don't blog angry. Is it? <laughs> I know, I always blog angry. My best <laughs> blogs are blogged angry. Yeah. But, but what you... But, but, you know, taking away, the, taking away the emotion of it, yeah, what you came up with was a, was a bit of a, uh, you know, rules for you know how to engage when uh you know w without you know without losing it one of the things I, I really hope for the event is we can um and i think in the man of you know in the, in the in the vision i put you know can convivially debate so i think i i, I set up the at our university i kind of re restarted the debating society so we did parliamentary debates i had rules we all went to the pub afterwards for a laugh you know um, nothing, uh, robert gordon's it was uh, one of the new ones uh <laughs> I, 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 uh, yeah, I didn't feel worthy to go I, to Aberdeen. I don't remember nights at Glasgow debating. I was convener of debates at Lancaster. Yeah. And I oh. got pulled in the annual Glasgow debate, and I have no memory of any of those debates because of the level of alcohol consumed thereafter. So. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, so actually, one of the things that, as we were in U University, uh, you know, I looked around and nobody had said, oh, uh, yeah, the debates, so we have to have this. And, and, 
and again, it, it it gave me this idea that you can debate and you can move forward. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um gonna hand over to you now for the rest of this. But and I, I really wanted to take however you want to, and I don't care. Um, I know you wrote some things on our uh, you know in our central documents. You then tweeted it. It got a huge response when you tweeted it, and I think it was just what we were needing. And I know you blogged about it. So if you just want to tell us around about that, and uh, you know, so and uh, we can put the the connections to these things in the notes so people can find them. Uh, but over to you. Yeah, I think it's worth looking a bit back at the origins of this. I mean, I I was one of the last to go through the grammar school system in Wales. And my sister, who was two years younger than me, was the first to go through the comprehensive system. Um, but the grammar school system then was quite classical. So I still remember at the age of 11 wearing long trousers for the first time. Because you weren't allowed to wear long trousers till you went to grammar school. You had to wear, you know... And in the winter of 63, shall we say, that was torture walking to primary school, right? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and I walked up to the front of the class and I got given a record card and it said, you support capital punishment. And I had to speak for seven minutes on something I think is profoundly evil without preparation. And we did that every week from the age of 11 to 18. And that was a profound training because you learned to argue for things you disagreed with, which actually made you more critical. And it also created a generation of generalists because you didn't know what you were going to get hit with. So you just read everything you could, including the newspapers. Yeah? And it also, you started to understand that you know, there's a ritual to understanding through conflict. Yeah? And we were also formally taught rhetoric. And I think that needs to come back into schools. What's rhetoric? I would. Rhetoric. I went. I went the comprehensive route, like your sister. Okay. Well, re rhetoric was. I mean, Aristotle and Plato attack it. All right, and they don't like the sophists because rhetoric. Uh, but I also grew up with Cicero. I have a great fondness for Cicero, and people should read the history of Cicero because he didn't kill T. Caesar when he had a chance, and that's where we got tyranny. And there's lots of parallels. Yeah. Um, between Caesar and Trump and yeah. Boris and things like that, if you look at it. So Cicero studied under the Greek sophists. Yeah. So the art of rhetoric is the art of public speaking. Yeah. Got you. And it's actually quite valuable to be taught it, even if you don't necessarily disagree with it, because you understand the principles. Yeah. So, and there are some quite vicious things you can do. I mean, metaphor is one of the most deadly ones. So, for example, I mean, we, we won all sorts of competitions at school, and one of the prizes was to debate with an American university, uh, sorry, an American school. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, the, the two of us on the team plus the three in support, yeah, and I was lead, and went across to Boston and got totally pissed with a bunch of Americans from a very posh American school. Yeah, it was... Yeah, you know, working class rural against Boston Brahmins, but we could all get drunk in Back Bay together. And I still remember, and we said, okay, so this is going to be fun. We're going to do this every night before the debate on Friday. And they said, no, 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 we get the motion tomorrow. So we have four days to prepare for it. And we sort of looked at them. You know, the idea of preparing for a debate was an alien one. So we just carried on getting drunk every night and turned up on the day and beat the pants off them because we paid attention to the audience. But the way you did it then, if you proposed, proposed it came first, but also came last, is you would deliberately, your seconder would introduce weak arguments that you knew they would attack. Ah, uh, like, yes, yes. But you'd have a metaphor to kill them with when you came in at the end, right? You're, you're taking me back now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And I still remember I was I was heckled, you know, there was, I was keynoting at a 2,000 person conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And I talked about the value of negative storytelling and a heckler stood up and said I was evil because, you know, yeah, a story should always be positive. And he was a practitioner and appreciative inquiry. Now, you, you should never heckle a keynote. Nobody gets to be a keynote if they can't cope with hecklers. Yeah. And the rule of rhetoric is very simple. Wait until the audience gets bored and then you kill them. Yeah, don't kill them up front because people will feel sorry for them. So you wait until the audience is shuffled. And I still remember doing it. I said, you guys just remind me of the final scene of Monty Python's Life of Brian with everybody swinging backwards and forwards <laughs> on the cross, singing, always look at the bright side of life. And the whole audience just collapsed in laughter. Now, that was cruel because he couldn't come back. Yeah. So one of the, you know, so that's, 
to me, that's a game, right? But if you're in serious dialogue with people, metaphors are really good to explain things, but they're a terribly destructive rhet rhetorical technique because you can associate with something which is ridiculous and they get no comeback. So that was kind of like one of the rules which was devised. Yeah. Um, there's also a lot of passive aggressive stuff. So you know, one of the rules which I put in, which is critical, is you mustn't assume moral superiority. Yeah. So the sort of, um, it's absolutely critical in this debate that we all do X, Y, Z. What you're actually saying is my opponent isn't doing it. It's quite a nasty type of, that's what you're really doing, yeah? Um, so the assumption that your position is moral, somebody else is immoral, or the statement of a moral principle, yeah? If it's associated with something you're saying, yeah, that, that's actually also dangerous, yeah? Um, anything yeah, I, I, which... I've, fallen, I've fallen down that one before. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I, so I think sometimes when I get emotional on a topic, um, there were some things on Facebook with... But yeah. what it does is it prevents the other person from actually responding. Yeah? I think I think in that situation, I even unfriended them on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, well, I've done that with a few Trump supporters of late, all right? Um, but that sort of, I'm more moral than you, I understand the principles of this, you know, this is unethical. I mean, words like unethical should be banned, right? In that sense, it's quite dangerous is what you're doing is you're trying to change the state so that your arguments will be more listened to, which means you're not interested in inquiry. Because the real real purpose of conflict is to explore different ideas. Yeah. Um, so that, that's yeah. Kind of another one that yeah I put up because it's there. And you also get people who make sort of claims to authority. It's kind of like, you know, I've done 100 projects, you haven't done projects, I've done this, I've done that. I'm dealing with a troll on Twitter at the moment um the galley troll as i call him yeah, who who basically just only believes there are large projects where everything can be estimated and everything can be controlled right and his standard form of argument is you know in, in my business you know metal hits the road i've done these projects what projects have you done if you actually give him projects you've done he ignores that because he's trying this argument from experience it's the assumption of authority um, and that's kind of like the corollary of ad hominem. So the basic I, principle. Is I think you have to break that break that down for the non-English speakers. Well, ad hominem is Latin, all right? Ad hominem yeah. means to attack the person, not the argument. Got you. And it's one of the basic rules, all right? So to attack the person, and also to do the other kind of like which is nasty is to do it by innuendo. So one of the things you frequently see is people, everybody knows who's been attacked, but the person is never named. Right? And yeah. I mean, I do that on Twitter. I'm, I, I should say I, all of these rules, I'm, I'm speaking as a, as a sinner, not just as a saint. All right? I think um, we all are. I mean, I, 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 I too I recognize everything you've said. I'll do it on Twitter as I'll put up an attack and see if the victim responds because then they've labeled themselves. Yeah. Um, so again, this is the, are you trying to win a battle or are you trying to do genuine inquiry? And I think in the sort of community we're talking about, we need that. Um, there's actually, Wikipedia is a really good example of this. I mean, I started editing Wikipedia 14 years ago. Um, and had a really interesting... Humorously. <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of, you, you and Semple, who's a bloody Scott who I blame for this, right? said, <laughs> I, said I needed to do it. And it's now, be, I mean, I, I'm now up in the top number of editors, all right? I, I'm monitoring 2,000 articles every morning. <laughs> that's your hobby. Um, that's going to be a retirement hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the first article I edited was the one on knowledge management, where I was one of the you know top ten mm -hmm. in the set. All right, and I, I corrected something about me. It was immediately reversed by another editor who said, "You obviously don't understand Snowden's work." <laughs> so it was, and and my yeah, my handle was Snow Dead, so there were some clues in this. All right. <laughs> And um, so I, I politely changed it and said, well, come on, I know what Snowden thinks. And I got told I was wrong again. So I had this vision of this, um, you know, young spotty teenager called Clint. And I, I, I had all this vision in my mind who thought he knew better than me. So I, I did an all out attack, all right, on, I, I wrote a Tales of the Wikipedia Virgin blog post and everything else. I was just starting blogging at the same time. It turned out to be an academic at the Scottish University. 
<laughs> and his students, students got hold of this, and he, he basically never ever lived it down, right? In in, in that sense, right? But Wiki, Wikipedia is the other reason I did it. It's the best example I know of a complex adaptive system. So Wiki, nobody will adjudicate content on Wikipedia. Okay. Yeah. yeah nobody. There isn't an authority on content, but it's entirely governed by an enabling constraint behavior. So if you do a personal attack, you're likely to get blocked. Okay. If you revert somebody a lot of times, you'll get blocked. Yeah. So all of the rules. So I've got actually people I get on with quite well who are far right editors in the States. Yeah. Because we play by the rules and that actually means good content emerges. So I, what I'm going to do on the blog post is link to the relevant Wikipedia policies because it's been well worked out by the community. But WPMPA is a classic. Yeah, no personal attacks on that. So, so the more we talk, I'm thinking um, that as we do things for um, you know, Agile 20 Reflect, we maybe have to do a little bit of education for people that are going to uh, perhaps enter into the, um, the, you know, the, the debate arena um, and, and, and some support and coaching just on how to do this. Because this isn't anything that um, I've been taught, this is, um, you know, I had some exposure when I set up the debating society, uh, but I think it's something that uh, maybe yeah, like right. civics, they just don't, you know, people don't teach anymore. It's, it's also more critical in the current environment. I mean, you've got, I mean, what's called epistemic justice, yeah? Or it's more, it's more frequently called epistemic injustice. So one of my staff, Beth, fellow South Wales, she's got a brilliant way of explaining this, all right? She says, when you say old men are philosophers and old wives tell tales, that's an example of epistemic injustice. Yes. Using language to categorize people. But you've got to actually know who you're arguing with. So as far as I'm concerned, if I'm arguing with a bunch of you know, white males with 30 or 40 years experience, yeah, you know, anything goes. Yeah. They're more than able to handle it, or if they're not able to handle it, they shouldn't have started in the first place. Yeah, subject to the standard rule. Yeah, but the, but even a... with somebody young and naive who's coming in the first time, there's a Wikipedia rule which says don't bite the newcomers. Yeah, and I like that, that. That's actually a really really important rule. Yeah. Or somebody who's in a disadvantaged state, you know, hasn't had the same sort of education. So, I mean, Max Brasser, who is my mentor, yeah, um, great guy. Um, died tragically early. Um, went to Gordonston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And I mean, he and I, when we got together, would argue. I mean, basically, people used to sell tickets because we'd go for each other's throats, but we hugely respected each other. Yeah. But if a young PhD student came up, he would just change his attitude and he'd give them hours. Yeah. Now, if they showed no respect or they didn't listen, he'd dismiss them. Yeah, but that ability to give anybody respect at whatever level they've got, but that doesn't mean false deferentials, you know, the sort of, you know, you should all stop arguing. Well, why the hell should we stop arguing? If you're up to it, carry on, because we're going to discover things in the conflict. Just going to stop you there for a second. So you've got a huge reputation, and uh, I think that stops people from debating you. Um, so I know, I know I'm on Mount Stupid on Kinefin. Right. I am completely on the top of Mount Stupid. Um, so I would never, I, you know, I would never engage with you on, on these things because I'm scared. I've got, you know, um, yeah, it's fear. Let's call it fear. Yeah. So how, how could, for this event where we want you know, broad participation and uh, convivial debating, right, how would we um, get over those kind of things? I think this is where you've got a problem. And I think you get I've got many, of... I've got many, many, many problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is one of them, all right? So, I mean, one of the things I said in one of the exchanges, all right, is you guys need to realize that authority should never be assumed, but it is granted, right? And I think it's important to realize that. So some people are more authoritative. Now, sometimes, so for example, I go walking with three doctors. Yeah? I was a good, a good, idea, a good idea at your age. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, my wife said she was encouraged by it, but I said no, because one doctor is fine, but three doctors, I die while they were up to that call. Um, I mean, God, they're contentious, bunch of bastards, right? Um, but so, sorry, I'm, I'm losing track of where I'm going with this. But the, the, the fundamental principle here is that 
um, if, you, if you want to engage with people in this sort of environment, it's appropriate to where they're coming from. Yeah, I think that, that's the point I'm making. Got you. Now, if you've got, if you've got authority, then you have to respect that. Um, and I would expect to respect it in turn. Right. I mean, I've got people I listen to, like Alicia and the like, and know damn sort of about, damn sight more about complexity than I do. I know more damn sight about how to apply it. Yeah. So if somebody says I should treat them as an equal because we're in a community and they haven't even read one book on complexity. Well, very sorry, I'm not going to, and they're going to get pretty much savaged. Right. Um, so there is this issue about respect for learning, respect for education, respect for experience. Uh, you can't have a level playing field, right? and I think that's critical. But part of that is through mediation. So one, one of the things we developed, it, because we, we address this big time in, in the methods we're doing, yeah, is a trioptican. Now, it's actually quite a clever technique. We've run it now for two years. So you get three heavyweights. And so session one, one of the heavyweights presents. Um, the other two attack. Okay. So everybody, everybody witnesses that. It, yeah. it is much better than the conference keynote, by the way. Conference keynotes, that they're fun, but you never get really good hard questions. Here you get questions. Yeah? And then everybody goes away in threes and discusses what was said. And a point, one of their number is the raven. And then the ravens come back and sit in a circle and discuss it. And the guys who were the, the heavyweights aren't allowed to say anything. They just Excellent. listen. This sounds very yeah. Celtic. I'm liking the Raven. I'm liking yeah. the threes. Well, I actually, I actually got it watching Aboriginal decision making in Kakadu in the 70s. Love it. But what then happens is you then repeat three times. So then the second expert presents, yeah, the other two attack. And then the groups go away in threes. But now the first Raven can't be a Raven anymore. So somebody else becomes a Raven. So after three rounds, everybody, yeah, has had a conversation and had to do what's called silent listening. And then the raven groups, so for example, if you've got eight raven groups of three, they become th three beaver groups of eight, who actually, again, take through and move it forward. So we've been developing methods which recognize the reality of authority, but neutralize it in terms of a negative impact on the group. I would love to try something. This is part of uh, Agile 20 Reflect. This is to teach oh, the technique. Uh, we're publishing it as an open source method and it's been practiced. Yeah. And what, what are you calling uh, so, it? It's a trioptican. Okay. The, it sounds, the it sounds, it, it sounds Doctor Who. <laughs> oh yeah, but I, I mean, I've, I've seen every episode of Doctor Who. There aren't many of us who've done that. All right. I've seen every single one. Right. Yeah. Um, it's actually also linked with pantopticon, which is the Jeremy Bentham idea. Yeah. The, so the, yeah, the, the, yeah. The prison. Yeah. Everything oh, is. Uh, you come again. Okay. Right. Yeah. Keep... Alba's back again. Yeah. yeah. I know. What does Alba want? If you see what we're doing with that, we're using a process to recognise reality. So we're not trying to. Sorry. I'll let let the finish. He's more important than I. Am. Yeah. Yeah. What we're not trying to do is to say everybody is equal because they're not in a debate. Some people are more equal than others in that respect. Right. And we're not trying to basically prevent experts presenting. But what we're doing is creating a process by which everybody can contribute. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving this conversation, and because um, I think there's there's there could be a wide variety of techniques, a wide variety of uh, a, a wide variety of things. One of the reasons, one of the things I'm thinking about with the Agile Twenty uh, Reflect as well is it's going to be online, and it's going to be some of it. I'm thinking more television yeah. than anything. And I think that would make a great television. We've uh, actually run trial to can now virtually. So, and I'll put it, I can put it up as another idea on the board along with the other three I've got. Yeah, um, no, and, and it, again, it might be quite a good idea. Yeah. And again, um, you know, you have a company of curmudgeons. I mean, Ron Jeffries and I are having a competition. Each of us claims the other is more curmudgeonly than, than we are, all right? In practice, we both want to be the most curmudgeonly, but we're being deferential. So if you can find a third one, that would be quite entertaining. I, I'm sure the, I'm sure we don't have any in the, in the community. <laughs> <laughs> that's an invitation for anyone watching this find Nick a budget um and, and again even the uh you know we could find other ways of doing things so um in in, in different ways as well uh but I'm, I'm loving the ideas and i'm and i really do want to support uh doing new ways of doing things um 
and, and that sounds like that could be a very useful technique. Interesting. Uh, One of the things I developed at Trioptican was as an alternative to open space. Because the law of two feet is really good news in some ways, but it means people can walk away from things they don't want to listen to. Yeah, yeah. And it's fairly easy to manipulate in open space. So this, I mean, open space I've used, I can facilitate it, but this was a, 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 a parallel technique, yeah, in which people can't avoid listening to things. Yeah, I like it. Um, and, and, the, and, and again, um, I see all these things as complementary. Um, and uh, and having different uses i'm also very experimental so as we go into you know agile 20 reflect i want to i want to almost like um my, okay my, my physics teacher always said teaching us was like hurling a wall so i'm gonna have to explain that and break it down so hurling is something we do in scotland so we cover the outside of our buildings with small stones because the weather's so bad and if we just had bricks the houses would go in about five years <laughs> and 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 my physics teacher told me that uh, what we what what happened was you have a you have a bucket full of small stones and then you cement the wall and you throw it, and then some sticks and the rest falls off and then you have to keep throwing and throwing and throwing until until you got enough stuck. Um, so so yeah, the, I think they're gonna the, the whole concept of this kind of like you know iterative learning, doing lots of different things, trying it and uh, and seeing if it sticks um, in the experimental side. Um, and and what will happen is by the end of this, we'll we'll see the things that people didn't enjoy, and we'll see the things that people you know didn't enjoy. And I'm hoping we can actually launch uh, you know widely some yeah some great stuff. And and uh, yeah, I really do like that, and uh, love the love the Bentham reference as well. Cool. Right. Um, I think we're I think we're kind of done. Um, thank you very much for your time. I know you're very busy, and thanks for. Uh, on, Honestly, the amount of people that have given me uh, their time for this crazy idea that I came up with um, has, has been amazing. Uh, we'll talk again, and, and and again, thank you very much for for um, you know your insight into into this. And I'm sure we can come back later and maybe do another talk on enabling constraints because that's another thing that I've really been trying to understand through this. So, bye bye, Scott. Bye bye. Cheers.